Church, if you will remain standing for our scripture reading. Tonight we're reading Colossians 2, 1 through 5. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, if you have a Bible, please open up to Colossians 2. We've made it to chapter 2. As you know, we've been walking through the book of Colossians, and I believe this is sermon number 6, I think, in this study. I want want to begin uh, with a story. Uh, My sister um, was in San Antonio this past uh, weekend, and she sent me a picture of her sitting in church and she was listening to uh, a pastor who I've had the privilege of meeting and spending just a little bit of time with and uh, that, that pastor was Max Licato. And, um, and so I, I want to I start with a story from Max called The Woodcutter's Wisdom. It's a little lengthy, but hang with me. It says, once there was an old man who lived in a tiny village, although poor, He was envied by all because he owned a beautiful white horse. Even the king coveted his treasure. The horse, a horse like this, had never been seen before in such splendor and majesty and strength. People offered fabulous prices for the horse, but the old man always refused. This horse is not a horse to me, he would tell them. It is a person. How could you sell a person? He's a friend, not a possession. How could you sell a friend? The man was poor and he was tempted greatly, but he never sold the horse. One morning he found that the horse was not in the stable. All the village came to see him. You old fool, they scoffed. We tried to tell you that someone would steal your horse. We warned you that you would be robbed. You are so poor. How could you ever hope to protect such a valuable animal? It would have been better for you to have sold him. You could have gotten whatever price you wanted. No amount would have been too high, and now the horse is gone, and you've been cursed with this misfortune. The old man responded, don't speak too quickly. Say only that the horse is not in the stable. That is all we know. The rest is judgment. If I've been cursed or not, how can you know? How can you judge? The people kept on, don't make us out to be fools. We may not be philosophers, but great philosophy is not needed. The simple fact that your horse is gone is a curse. The old man spoke again. All I know is that the stable is empty and the horse is gone. The rest I do not know. Whether it be a curse or a blessing, I cannot say. All we can see is a fragment. Who can say what will come next? The people of the village laughed. They thought that the man was crazy. They had always thought he was a fool. If he wasn't, he would have sold the horse and lived off the money. But instead, he was a poor woodcutter, an old man still cutting firewood and dragging it out of the forest and selling it. He lived hand to mouth in the misery of poverty, and now he had proven that he was indeed a fool. After 15 days, the horse returned. He hadn't been stolen, he had run off into the forest, and not only had he returned, but he brought with him a dozen wild horses. Once again, the village people gathered around the woodcutter and spoke, Old man, you were right, and we were wrong. We thought this was a curse, but it was actually a blessing. Please forgive us. The man responded, Once again, you go too far. Say only that the horse is back. 
State only that a dozen horses return with him, but don't judge. How do you know if this is a blessing or not? You see only a fragment. Unless you know the whole story, how can you judge? You read only one page of a book. Can you judge the whole book? You read only one word of a phrase. Can you understand the entire phrase? Life is so vast, yet you judge all of life with one page or one word. All you have is a fragment. Don't say this is a blessing. No one knows. I am content with what I know, and I'm not perturbed by what I don't. Maybe the old man is right, they said to one another. So they said little, but deep down they knew he was wrong. They knew that this was a blessing. Twelve wild horses had returned with one horse. With a little bit of work, these animals could be broken and trained and sold for much money. The old man had a son, an only son. The young man had begun to break the wild horses. After a few days, though, he fell off one of the horses and broke both his legs. Once again, the villagers came around and cast their judgments. Oh, you were right, they said. You proved you were right. The dozen horses, they're not a blessing. They are a curse. Your only son has broken his legs, and now in your old age, you have no one to help you. Now you are poorer than ever. The old man spoke again, you people are obsessed with judging. Don't go so far. Say only that my son has broken his legs. Who knows if it is a blessing or a curse? No one knows. We only have a fragment. Life comes in fragments. It so happened that a few weeks later, the country that he lived in was engaged, became engaged in a war against a neighboring country. All the young men in the village were required to join the army. The only, or only the son of the old man was excluded because he was injured. Once again, the people gathered around the old man crying and screaming because their sons had been taken. There was little chance that they would return. The enemy was strong and the war, uh, and the war would be a losing struggle. They would never see their sons again, they thought. You were right, old man, they wept. God knows you're right. This proves it. Your son's accident was a blessing. His legs may be broken, but at least he's with you. Our sons are gone forever. The old man spoke again. It is impossible to talk with you. You always draw conclusions. No one knows. Say only this. Your sons had to go to war, but mine did not. No one knows if it is a blessing or a curse. No one is wise enough to know. Only God knows. Unless you know the whole story, how can you judge? Read only one page of a book. Can you judge the whole book? You read only one word of a phrase. Can you understand the entire phrase? Life is so vast, yet you judge all of life with one page or one word. So many times, what we think is wisdom is many times a jump to conclusions. And we, like the villagers, I think many times, base our wisdom off fragments or moments of time and experiences that we have within that time. But that doesn't mean there's not this thing called wisdom when it comes to life. In fact, everyone believes in the concept of wisdom. But not everyone agrees on its source and how do we get it. But there are a few popular options out there. Option number one is that wisdom comes with age. You may have heard that. Well, if that were true, then people who reached or attained a certain age would just become instantly, infinitely wise. Option number two is that wisdom comes with education. Well, there's a vast array of educated people who can't agree on the simplest things. Option number three is that wisdom comes from experience. Well, there's a lot of experienced people who make habitual mistakes. The Bible makes another claim about wisdom, and that claim is found in James 3.17. It simply says four words, wisdom is from above. The Bible makes the claim that there is this thing called wisdom, but its source is from above. Its source 
is from God. Or Proverbs 3.19, it says, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. Meaning the Lord, by his wisdom, created all that is and everything that moves and all the ways that the world works together and holds together in the heavens was founded in that way because of God's wisdom. Or the call of Proverbs 5.1, my son, be attentive to my wisdom. How? Incline your ear to my understanding. Meaning, don't lean on your own understanding. Or Proverbs 8.11, wisdom is better than jewels and all that you desire, meaning in this life, cannot compare to it. The Bible makes the claim that wisdom is so valuable that you could have all the jewels of the earth. But if you don't have wisdom, you don't have anything. Or the crazy claim of 1 Corinthians 1.24. This claim, it says, quote, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That the wisdom that is from above is found in a person people call the Christ. Wow. <clears throat> Basic question, what is wisdom? I agree with this definition. It says, wisdom is the ability to apply biblical truths to all life situations, end quote. I agree with that. Wisdom is the ability, it is an ability, to apply, it has to be applied, biblical truths, an objective, moral referent beyond us, the Bible, to all life situations, everything we experience in life. And again, tonight, I want to talk about your new wisdom. Because if Christ is the wisdom of God, as 1 Corinthians 1.24 claims, and if I am in Christ, it means I have a new wisdom in my life. I have access to the wisdom of heaven, the wisdom that is from above. It can actually be applied to my life and lived out in my life. C.S. Lewis said, if we find within us a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, we should begin to wonder whether we were not created for another world. I think that's so true and it applies in so many different ways. And I think the, one of the ways we see that is that we actually crave, as human beings, this thing called wisdom. We want it. We want wisdom. But if James 3.17 is true and wisdom, true wisdom comes from above, it means that we crave something we can't find on this planet. We are craving something that you can only find in heaven and only comes from God. So wisdom, what we see is at the core of this passage. So I want to talk, I want to give you six points in these five verses. And I want us to look at these wise actions and their results. Point number one is this, if you like to take notes. And it is that wise people share their struggles with others. We see this by example in Paul. He begins in Colossians 2 verse 1. He says, for I want you to know something. I want you to know how great a struggle, just that one phrase right there, Paul being vulnerable and Paul sharing in this moment, I want you to know something, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, church in Colossae, and for those in Laodicea, nine miles down the road, and for all, meaning all in your area, who have not seen me face to face. So the first thing we see Paul do is he is sharing his struggles, which is a wise thing because people cannot pray for or help what they don't know about, right? I mean, that's like logical, right? People cannot pray for or help what they don't know about. Now, <clears throat> what Paul is not doing here is oversharing, okay? Please help me. I, I mean, stay with me. Paul's not oversharing. Uh, that happens a lot today. Especially, you know, people, you know, you're staying up late at night, you got keyboard confidence, you pull out your phone and Facebook is there and you decide to share. Okay? You got to be careful with that. What Paul is doing is I'll call it gospel sharing. He's sharing the struggle and he's very specific of his laboring for the church in Colossae, for the church in Laodicea right down the road, and then for those in that area who have not seen him face to face, who he hasn't met. Because remember, Paul didn't plant the church in Colossae. In fact, he hasn't been there. 
But he knows the struggle that's going on there and he begins to share the struggle that's going on. And part of this gospel sharing, as I call it, is so that people can be educated. Yes, they can know. They can also be equipped on how to pray for you, but also it's encouraging. Sharing your gospel struggles encourages other people. All of a sudden they realize, I'm not alone. I'm actually trying to work for the Lord, uh, live according to his will, do it according to his ways because I trust his wisdom last Sunday, right? But, I, but I'm not alone in this struggle. And that's exactly where Paul goes and we see that in verse 2. Point number one is that wise people share their struggles with others. Point number two is that wisdom grows through love for and from others. We actually teach each other. So he says to them, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those in, uh, at Laodicea, and for all those who have not seen me face to face, verse 2 goes on, that their hearts may be encouraged. He says, in me sharing the struggle, I actually want your hearts to be encouraged. And, and he wants them to be encouraged in many different ways. But notice the desired outcome that he wants in this verse. He says, I want your hearts to be encouraged, and here's what I want to see happen, uh, being knit together in love. In this sharing, I want us to be knit together in love. That, that phrase, knit together, it literally means to prove. I want us to prove our love for one another. Now, this is not that kind of mandating proof. If you, if you have someone in your life who's always saying, I need you to prove that, that you love me. If you have someone, that's called a toxic person, just so you know. If they're always demanding that you prove yourself to them. No, no, no that's not what he's talking about. What, what he's saying here is that there's this natural proving, this natural evidence that we love one another when we're able to open up. But again, that they're encouraged, the desired effect is they'll be knit together in love. But being knit together has two outcomes that he wants for them. Notice, being knit together in love to reach two things. To reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. I absolutely love that sentence. <laughs> Do you see what he just said? He says, when we are knit together in love, I want us to be encouraged so that we're knit together in love. And when we're knit together in love, there are two things that come from that. Full assurance of understanding. Notice the word assurance. And the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Notice the word mystery. Paul says, when we are knit together in love, when we share our life together, a gospel sharing is taking place. You can have assurance about a mystery. You see that? Full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is great. You can have assurance about a mystery. And then he says, which is Christ? Christ is the mystery that has been revealed. I told you Sunday, the three mysteries, the gospel, God saves through Christ, death, burial, resurrection, that this second mystery is for the Gentiles as well. Third mystery, end of the age, book of Revelation. But what Paul is saying here is that because we love one another, and wisdom grows here. And there's this assurance. And the reason why wisdom grows is because there's this assurance that we have about the mystery of God. The mystery is now revealed. It is in Christ. Now, to a lost world, still a mystery. Doesn't make sense. They look at Christ and they go, that doesn't make sense at all. But when you see him, in his, his beauty, his majesty, his sacrifice, oh, it's all revealed. And if Christ is love, then we are knit together in him in that way. So wise people share their struggles with others, gospel sharing. Wisdom grows through love for and from others, which leads me to number three, naturally, wisdom is found, therefore, in Christ. True wisdom is found in Christ. He says, I want you to have full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. The sentence goes on, verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, the mystery has been revealed, but you have to be in Christ to understand. Because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so we say, how do we have wisdom? You have to know Christ. Well, then the question becomes, okay, I know Christ. I know who he is. I know what he did for me. I believe that. How does his wisdom get into my life? Three ways. One, 
is through the revealed wisdom of the Word. Two is through the real-time wisdom of the Spirit. And three is through the received wisdom of the saints, both living and dead. Say those again. How Christ's wisdom gets into our life. You want to be wise? You want Christ to impart wisdom into you? It comes into your life three ways. The revealed wisdom of his word. The real-time wisdom of the spirit of God that lives in you. I mean, if you've ever been in a situation, you don't know what to do, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit brings something to mind, real-time wisdom of the spirit. And then the received wisdom from the saints. Again, both living and dead. Those saints that are living, we have direct contact with, right? And then those who are dead, we have indirect contact with through their testimony, most of the time through writing. But in those three ways, that's how the wisdom of Christ gets imparted into our life. We don't just like magically wake up one day and go, oh, all of a sudden, I'm wise, right? Like wisdom comes with age. You just reach a certain age and all of a sudden you're magically wise. That's not how it works. But it's imparted through his word, through the spirit, and through the saints. So wisdom is found in Christ. That's how it gets into us because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Number four is this. When I have this wisdom because I am in Christ, number four is that wisdom keeps you from being misled. Wisdom then, this wisdom that is only found in Christ, who is the wisdom of God, it keeps me from being misled. Colossians 2, 4. I say this in order that no one may be, or that no one may delude your, you with plausible arguments. That, that word delude there means you don't want deluded thinking. That your mind can be so full of what he calls plausible arguments. Those are well-crafted persuasions. That's what that phrase means. You see, our thinking can become divided. But it's not just divided like cut in two. It, it can become diluted. That's a good image for it there. It can become diluted by well-crafted rhetoric, he's saying. And he says, I don't want that for you. I want you to understand that wisdom is only found in Christ. You have to be in Christ to have access to that wisdom. It's imparted into your life, word, spirit, saints, yes. And when you have that, though, you're going to be able to pick up on the wisdom of the world, as he calls it in 1 Corinthians. These well-crafted, plausible, persuasive arguments that are there. Because wisdom is not just a mind game. See, some people sound smart and they leave people confused. Right? And people go, wow, they're just so smart. No, no. You're confused. It just sounds smart. Right? Wisdom is the application of confirmed truth in the life of a believer, according to Paul here. That's how I think he would define it. Wisdom is the application, I apply it to my life, of confirmed truth in the life of a believer. And I say confirmed, how's it confirmed? Three ways, word, spirit, saints. And notice I'm saying and, and, saint. You see, word, and, spirit, and saints. Not, not just one. Like there are people who walk around, they say, well, the Lord just speaks to me, the spirit speaks to me. They don't worry about what the word says or they don't worry about what saints, the saints say, either living or dead. And it's like, yeah, you know, I've met a lot of people. I even grew up in a tradition where, you know, the Lord seemed to be speaking about everything. Like even like what color socks you should wear today, right? It's like, man, that's a whole lot of talking, you know? But, but you got to be careful with that. The question is, what does God's word say about it? Yes, what does the spirit say? And then also, what do saints say? The ones who speak into your life now, and then also those of history. But it keeps us from being misled, and that's what Paul wants for the Colossians. Number five. If that's going to happen, that means that wisdom activated in our life, wisdom leads us to center our lives around Christ. To center our lives around Christ, who is the wisdom of God, verse 5. For though I am absent from the body, he tells them, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Notice the phrase, your good 
order. It's the Greek word taxin, T-A-X-I-N, taxin. It, it means you've arranged things in proper order. Or the word good, again in the first century context, means godly. You could say your godly order. How you've arranged your life in a godly order. You see, it's not only wise to, but also wisdom comes from reordering your life around the supremacy of Christ. That's Colossians 1.15 and following, right? <clears throat> so it's not only wise to do that, but wisdom comes from that as well. And so wisdom, yes, leads us to center our lives around Christ because he is the source of all the wisdom. But it's not only wise to do it, wisdom comes from it. Because there's a difference between wanting wisdom in your life and then reordering your life around Christ so that he's at the center of everything. There's a difference in doing that and wanting God to bless your dysfunction. Ouch. You with me? There's a, there's a huge difference. And just saying, where are you, God? Where are you, God? The question is, have we reoriented and rearranged good order? Have we arranged our life around the supremacy of Christ, where he is supreme above all things, where he actually rules and reigns as Lord over our lives, or do we just want him to bless our mess? Right? We're never going to get wisdom without a radical reordering of our life around who he is exalted and lifted high as Lord. And Paul tells them that. And then number six is that wisdom leads to stronger faith. So back in verse five, for though I'm absent from the body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Now, you know that stability only, it comes from the thing that supports it. You with me there? See, a stable, if I'm stable in the present right now, it's because something is supporting me. I'm stable standing on the stage, it's because the stage is supporting me. Everybody with me there? Very important. And so, any stability I have in my life, it's not my stability. I didn't create the stability. It comes from who is supporting me. Because an object's stability comes from the thing upon which it rests. And so when it comes to wisdom, we have to ask the question, what are we resting on? Who are we resting in? Because that is the thing that either provides stability or not. And last time I checked, according to Scripture, there's only one place where you can find stability. So that means if I am stable, if you're stable in your life, if things are in good order, your faith, firmness, that's what it's talking about, stable. There's a stability there. It's firm, it's solid. Again, it's stable. If I'm stable, if you're stable, it's because our house is built on the rock. So I can't boast about my strength or my stability because the strength and stability, the firmness of faith that I have, that you have, is actually given to us by someone else. It's given to us by Christ. It's not ours. All any person can do is to rearrange their life around Christ and who he is. That's how we get the wisdom. And then this firmness of faith, the stability in our life, wisdom is what leads to that. It's when we're tossed to and fro, living with confusion in our heart and mind, when we feel unstable, right? That's when we're out of sync with Christ or our house is not built or being built on the rock. So wisdom is from above. Wisdom is from above. James would say also, if you need wisdom, what do you do? You ask for it. And then James would say also, you have not because you ask not. So let's ask for wisdom. That's what I want to pray tonight. Yeah, I pray that we would be wise, sharing our struggles with others, others a gospel sharing. 
growing through love for and from one another. But all of that for Paul to the church in Colossae pushes them that their lives would be founded on Christ. They would not be misled. Everything would be centered around him. And then there is a stability that comes from this kind of wisdom that comes from above. Make sense? Let's pray for wisdom then. Father, would you, in this moment, give us wisdom. The kind of wisdom and the areas of wisdom that we need as individuals. Lord, what we know about life is that every one of us are about to make numerous decisions even before we go to bed tonight. And so we need wisdom. Lord, what we know is that tomorrow, if it is your will, we will wake up. And we will go about a day making numerous decisions again. And so we need your wisdom. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's asking what they feel like are big questions right now. And Lord, I pray that you would bless with a divine wisdom. And Lord, I pray for any of us that if we're not in you, if our lives have not been reoriented back to the supremacy of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that, that we would do that. Because it's not going to work otherwise. You're not going to bless without our eyes completely fixed and minds and hearts fascinated with who your son is and what he's done for us. So Lord, may that happen, that we may walk in your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.